they would always hold this contract up and say, well, you signed it. I wanted to write stinging things. I've been re-recording my albums. When I well, we always wanted to write our own material. I'll always make what I want to make. When I first started out in this music industry, I was most concerned with freedom. A freedom to produce, freedom to play all the instruments on my records, freedom to say anything I wanted to. I embarked on a journey more fascinating than I could have ever imagined. This world and its wicked system will become harder and harder to deal with. It ain't over. So what he was doing was not only for himself, but it was for everybody. Lately, there's been a shift to a potentially harmful force in our industry. The unregulated world of private equity buying up our music as if it's an app or a shoe line. When the seeds of life are dispensed on the future planets, who should carry the uploaded files of Duke Ellington, Jimi Hendrix, and Sloss? Who should replant the seed of Curtis Mayfield and Mavis, Aretha, and the Jackson Fudge? Who should profit from the fruits of our labor? The top music lawyers think of the artists as disposable supposed and believe that they should be the ones to bring music into the 22nd century and beyond, redefining everything artistic into property, intellectual or otherwise. We all together have started to study words like con, track. Con being the prefix means something negative. It's the opposite of pro. Words like consequence. We don't want to adopt somebody else's way of doing business. We don't want to be the end. We're the genesis. I was thinking about your question a second ago. Um, I think I want to teach in some capacity. Artists talk about the trials and tribulations of the industry all the time, ways that we could change things if we had our way. All of us signed these really restrictive agreements where you can't get out of them until you deliver X amount of product, and that product would actually belong to the corporation that you're recording for. I started a publishing company called Jobet Music, the biggest independent publishing company in the yeah. business. And when you, you sold Motown, you kept that, right? I kept that. That company paid everybody. I still have songs that I refuse to record. I feel they're smashes. I mean, I'm probably as prolific a songwriter as any songwriter ever was. The problem was a political one with Motown. You see, my publishing deal with Motown isn't uh, flexible enough that I can afford for them to have them. I'm waiting for the day that they treat me with the proper respect. On his 21st birthday, and coming back to California, there was a wire from Steve, his attorney, disaffirming every contract that he had with Motown. We still have an understanding. We're still close. It's just that basically now, and I feel that the only way that I can do what I want to do totally in, is to be free enough to do them. There is um, tampering with one's art, which drives me Absurd. I wouldn't think Leonardo da Vinci would put up with somebody changing an ear or nose or the eyes or the Mona Lisa. Or... I don't feel people should tamper with an artist's work. Never did I suggest Barry's been bad to me. <laughs> I never said that. Bad. I never said that. Barry's been in too. Motown did that to me. A lot of people that went broke with Motown, man. A lot of people that starved to death, you know? A lot of people that made millions and millions and millions of dollars and sold lots of records, and they're on the corners now, you know, picking up bags and cans, you know, and stuff like that. That's, that's not a very pleasant thought. Fortunately, I wasn't one of those people. I, I, I very well could have been if it was up to Motown. They would have loved to see me in that situation. They seemed to make you just to break you. I felt puppeteered. That was a very necessary thing because it made me very independent of them. So I wanted to write an album, and I wanted to write stinging things and music that would really make people say, wow, he's after us, and maybe incense them also. Well, one of the early days in Motown, they kind of like classical days. I mean, we were so young at the time. Where we always wanted to write our own material and have our own publishing company and production company, different things like that. There's so many different things that I wanted to do and uh, being able to do it is important because it's kind of difficult to get people to believe in you you know you have to tell them I, I want to do it for once and some people believe in you some don't and finally they give you the chance and they see what you can do and then they let you do it you got to do what you got to do. He wanted to reorganize the, his whole deal with me. He was saying, like, why, why did you do this? And I said, you know, I, I want to do the way I want to I wanna do it. And he wanted full control of everything. I was petrified. I was forced to relent to his demand. But the thing that really bothered me the most 
was cheating of the artist. In my case, because of the rumors, misinformation and all that, even some of the artists believed it. I didn't relate very well over there. A lot of music came out and, and success for Rick. I learned a lot and I got a lot of good things out of it. The bad times were more than the good times, you know? It was pretty bad. I had Square Biz out, I had Portuguese Love out, I had I Need to Love In, I had Behind the Groove, I had all these hits, Fire and Desire, all that stuff was out by that time. <laughs> Started off at $600 a month when I left. They sued me and I countersued. There's a congressional bill in my name now. At that time, you're supposed to pay your artist $6,000. I wasn't even making that much. This law was set in 1911. In 1911, $6,000 was an incredible amount of money. In 1981, it was nothing. I had been on Epic for probably a year or two when they finally passed the bill. Why just sell it? A lot of people thought, don't sell Motown. The world has changed tremendously, and there are about six companies now that control the distribution of about 90% of the music. These corporate giants really control the business. Everybody's buying everybody. I mean, in the future, it, this discussion is going to start to barrel into a discussion about the human genome and the DNA and all the rest of it. When it gets there, then we're going to be in the deep water. It's better to start the conversation now before we get into God talk. Record company presidents have to open up conversations with artists, perhaps loosen up some of these bindings in the contracts and release their music the way they want. Let's go back a little bit, 93. You started talking about the industry. You were the first, I think, to talk about the way artists were treated and to reclaim the art by the artist. I got into a situation with Warners where I wanted to leave. They said, you can't leave, we have you under contract. We have agreed to sit down and talk. Yeah. We didn't say we're going to do interviews every year for seven years, right? No. Nope. It doesn't even make sense, does it? Sooner or later, we have to learn to trust one another. A contract just simply means you don't trust that person. So you expect something to go wrong. Contract to tie up your future. How do you know what you'll be recording and feeling like three or four albums from now? I'm like, I didn't sign the deal. What do I care? I had my own issues about whatever business situation we were in. I was a little too short-sighted to understand this was a real problem. My trouble with him overshadowed his trouble with them. Did you feel you had something to do with this dialogue taking place now amongst these artists? Frank Ocean. Oh. I so that man figured out how to finesse the record industry, and people don't talk about that. Smash and grab job, huh? Slightly more complicated than that. Frank Ocean's name change came from his love of Ocean's Eleven, starring Frank Sinatra. He's a genius, based off the fact that he had a deal. Frank Ocean signed with Def Jam back in 2012. When he signed with them, he signed a two-album deal. He's had issues with Def Jam. He felt neglected by Def Jam. He felt like he'd been signed and stored away. 2011, Frank had been signed for almost two years without releasing a single or project. Frank released the mixtape for free, without any warning. People had only known him as Lonnie Bro. Eagle sample has no chance in hell of being cleared. Def Jam wouldn't clear the samples. I just put Frank on the map. I worked with Beyonce before. I worked with Jay. I did the Watch the Throne sessions. The execs from his record label tried to sign him to a deal without realizing he was already signed to them. You, you have your mixtape. Absolutely like, do you have not. a fancy car? I drive an 89 E30 Beamer. At this point in your career, you get on two songs on Watch the Throne. There's a lot of interest in you, which brought a whole new group of people right. onto who you are. And you come from a super interesting crew. I, I walked into a room with Jay, Beyonce, Kanye heavy room mm -hmm. i rarely do collabs so that's just one of the ones you you just absolutely do it's you like do a no-brainer yeah i didn't really think about any of it do you have an idea when your album is coming out nah i have no idea listen you're in a great position right now wherever this is that i am right now it was real cool first album you released called channel orange and it's an absolute smash hit and debuts at number two on the billboard chart going on to win a grammy february 2013 frank announced that he was working on his next album after more than three years, Frank Ocean dropped his next album. Blonde came out this bizarre twinned release with this other album, Endless, which was the contract fulfillment album. Endless, the video, is him building something which then lead into Blonde, which is the full project. He was building his way off of Def Jam. Absolutely. And then immediately released this new album, Blonde, that's way better than Endless. That was a ploy to get out of his long-term record contract. Blonde was praised as a masterpiece. It received rave reviews and was unanimously considered one of the best albums to come out that year. He did a lot in 48 hours. 
And it's a weird mix of like brilliant artistic achievement and scam. Say that there was no money in the bag, sir. What do you mean there's no money in the bags? Give him a bullshit album, get out his deal once he gave them endless. Drop his deal. And what we saw on the monitor wasn't actually happening. He got a $20 million check from Apple. He figured out how to make the funds apply to a blonde. And he didn't have to give any of that shit back to the label because he was already out his deal from Lucian Grange. I don't like people cheating. I care deeply about music, uh, real music and real opportunity and real artists than I do algorithms pushing fake products or fintech or that's not what everybody here is for or about. Do you know how embarrassed the record industry was? Do you know how hard they've been whipping artists since then? Like this some real slave shit, like you feel me? And now we've got a, a different kind of challenge, a different conversation. Just doing what you want is so important. Creativity in general, doing what you feel is write the songs I wrote and what I decided to do. It really is me. I want people to know that no matter what they think I should make, I'll always make what I want to make. If you are owned, you are owned. That's not to equate myself with the situations that we suffered coming to this country, but everything is relative. I can't use Purple Rain. And I did all the work, I created it, so it should belong to me. The um, company felt otherwise, and they would always hold this contract up and say, well, you signed it. Well, I understand that. It's not like I want to leave. I just want to talk about this thing and see if we can't make it more fair. I can't sell the song Purple Rain unless I record it again, mm -hmm. which I have plans to do if I can't, in fact, get the master recording. If you can't do everything that you want to do, you are, in fact, a slave. Taylor Swift is the music industry. The one-time teen country singer became a pop powerhouse. Since then, she's won just about every music award there is. Exciting. Taylor Swift writes or co-writes all of her songs. There have been so many songs I've written at this piano. I knew he would sell my music. I knew he would do that. I couldn't believe who he sold it to. The scooter managers, Justin Bieber, Kanye West, Ariana Grande, one of the biggest managers in the music business. Ugh, my entire catalog sold to Ithaca Holdings, owned by powerhouse music manager Scooter Braun for $300 million. Scooter never contacted me or my team to discuss it prior to the sale. This just happened to me without my approval, consultation, or consent. We've had endless conversations about Scooter Braun. The person who owned Taylor's Masters throughout her career was not myself. I made it very clear that I wanted to buy my music. That opportunity was not given to me. And when I was buying a record label, I said to that group, if she wants to be part of this conversation, please let me know because I wouldn't do this deal. I was shown an email that's been out public now uh, where she stated that she had decided to move on from that negotiation and wasn't interested in doing that deal anymore. I was denied the chance to purchase my music outright. I found out when it was online, like when it hit the news. His company bought Scott Borchetta's Big Machine label group. And I did present that. I think there's a lot of facts out there. If something's toxic and it's only ever really been that, what are you going to do? What you can't do is say that you want something and then never, ever sit down to have an actual dialogue. You can move on without any of those things happening. You don't have to forgive and you don't have to forget. And I was always open to selling back along the way at a fair market value. None of these investors ever bothered to ask how I might feel about the new owner of my art. People have said certain things. Those narratives aren't necessarily true. What Taylor did is brilliant. I was the one who made this music first. I can just make it again. So that's what we're doing. So I've been re-recording my first six albums when I changed record labels. Taylor has every right to re-record because I've never said anything bad about her in the past and I won't start to now. <laughs> People had something to say about me. I usually said something back. I disagree with weaponizing a fan base. You don't do that. It's very dangerous. There's people within that fan base who have mental health issues. There's families involved. And I think that's very, very dangerous. I think that there's a responsibility with the fan base. That's all I'll say about that. Genius is next door to insanity. I was asked to change my name. Uh, it seemed pretty absurd at the time. Even if it wasn't legally acceptable, he was going to push the envelope. And of course, that became NPG Records. It became the record he made that ended up coming out on NPG under the name of the band that was really a Prince record that Warners had rejected. It was a uh, defamation. Pagnoli, yeah. Pagnoli and them uh, tried to sue Prince and said that, that that was about them. The NPG album, go <laughs> Oh, well. They had to go to court over that. We started courting. A lot of these tracks were really directed at Warner Brothers.
What do you think of the Grey album? Do you ever hear that? Danger Mouse is reworking of the White yeah, Album. Yeah, you know, I heard it. I must admit, I heard it kind of once and thought, not as good as ours. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> dude. Of course, I'm, I was on the original. <laughs> oh, you dude, know. of course. I don't I think know, that was his. I, I don't think that was his mission. <laughs> it was. You Believe think? me, I spoke to him. Yeah. No, no. Um, his re reworking of 99 Problems with uh, with Helter Skelter was killer, though. That was. Yeah, that was that's what I mean. It was. It was interesting. You know, it was really interesting, and I think it was a. It was a. It's a good story. Yeah. yeah. But I think you know, cool idea and everything. And it was, it was, I like to see people do that. Prince is probably my favourite modern act. I went to see his concert at Wembley. It was good. What do you like so much about him? About Prince, he's an innovator and he doesn't go the way everyone else goes. He seems to stand out from the crowd. He looks good, he dances good, he sings great, plays great guitar. And I like a lot of his songs, I like a lot of his albums, even the ones that kind of don't do that well. Either. Even during that whole process, man, you know, he called me up, we'd be on the road, I would send the cop on me and I'd end up at Abbey Road Studio record. McCartney put the veto on that as, yeah, as soon as they tried to clear it. McCartney said, no, 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 not for you lot. <laughs> when we were working there, we didn't actually know he was pulling together an ELP. I mean, again, a lot of this stuff, it was just us in the studio clowning. It did. I didn't know it was going to be a segue. I didn't know what it was going to be. Things and songs would derive out of just all of us joking around and having these conversations. So we were the conduit to deliver that message. So when I was spitting like Black Mama, and I was, man, he was all over. He had his vision, which I still didn't know about. The band did not know about. Prince will take something and run with it. And then before we knew it, he comes in and plops down this cassette full of songs and says, hey, here's your album. Here's the MPG album. We're like, what? We're like, whoa, wait a minute. We didn't even talk about what the album was going to be. Wait a minute, bro. Hold up. I'm the front man. We never talked about a concept. Yeah. To be honest with you, some of these tracks aren't <laughs> things that I would put on an album or release. I'd like to do something a little different. I mean, we've cut a lot of tracks. Our segues are crazy. To me, it wasn't coherent at the time. There was no flow to the LP. It was a shame it didn't actually release release because there were some bangers on there. You know, but Prince had his vision and, and what he wanted to do. He was putting this out as a message. This was him beginning his militant stage. That led him to be a, be a crusader for musicians everywhere. I can uh, uh, take the music and repackage it and sell it in various arenas, uh, direct to consumer, at concerts, all kinds of things.